Hi and welcome to the channel. If you've been here before, welcome back. If it's your first time here, stick around because today we're talking CML. Hi everyone, so uh, welcome again to our video. Um, the video that I'm doing today has um, been a long time coming. Um, this one I'm going to be talking about CML, uh, which is chronic myeloid leukemia and how it affects me. Um, we are parked up currently down at Rock Beach, uh, which is my favourite beach, favourite spot. Um, Bracken, in. Just had Bracken <laughs> running around on the beach. Come on, get in. He's a little bit too nebby at the minute. So he's been running about, uh, throwing the ball for him, which is great because it only means I have to walk about 10 feet where he walks it. He runs about two miles. So I should tire him out enough just to get through this video. So I'm just making a quick cuppa and then we'll crack on. So we're back. Um, now we've got a nice cup of coffee. Um, we're just sitting in the back of the van at the moment, um, I'll show you what we have. So we've got Bracken there, just lying watching the world go by. <laughs> and we're right down on the coastline. This is Rocker. Rocker Beach, one of my favourite beaches of all times. Spent a lot of time here as a kid. <laughs> So anyway, back to the CML. Um, <clears throat> so what is CML? Um, CML is chronic myeloid leukemia or chronic myelogenous leukemia. It's it can be found at any age, but it's more typical in someone who's a bit older, uh, late 50s, 60s. Um, I'm currently 56. I was diagnosed in 2017. Now, in the past, uh, times gone by, if you had chronic myeloid leukemia, I think the lifespan at the time was around about three to five years. Um, now, ironically, chronic myeloid leukemia is a rare cancer. It's um, it develops in your bone marrow and your white blood cells is what's affected. So the white blood cells basically attack the, the, the red blood cells, the good ones. Um, and you can become really poorly if it's not treated and diagnosed. Um, as I said, it was 2019 when I was first diagnosed. So what happened? How did I get diagnosed? So I, I never used to go to the GPs, never went to the doctors, um, very rarely. But I was feeling really tired and just off is the only way I can describe it. I've normally led um, up until this point. I've been quite active. Um, I used to do a lot of scuba diving. Um, anything to do with water, I was, I was in there. That's obviously why I've got the love for the beach and the coast. So I was quite active. I'd been running as well to get fit. I would regularly run five and six K, maybe three times a week. That was doing really well, and obviously I was losing weight. <laughs> Sorry, Bracken's just had uh, somebody's piqued his interest or another dog. Bracken, stay. Yeah, something piqued his interest. Oh, just turn around a little bit. So yeah, um, I was pretty fit and losing weight as well while I was running. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, people keep walking past with the dogs and <laughs> keep looking in the back of the van. So, as I say, I was, I was quite fit, losing weight. And then, as I say, I felt a bit off. 
it's really hard to describe when I say off because, like I said, I was sort of quite fit at the time, but it, it was I didn't feel right, and I was getting a bit of a pain um, in my abdomen, sort of on the left side. I was getting a little bit of pain every now and again. Um, it was like if you gasped in, you felt like a sharp stab, but it, that was it, and then it went. But every now and again, you'd get it, but it was just a quick sharp stab. So anyway, I went to the, the GP. I managed to get an early appointment before going to work. So I think it was about a eight o'clock appointment. So I went in, saw the GP. He gave us a full check over. Couldn't find anything really, but he was concerned that I'd, I'd went in the first place. He was like, obviously, you know, you don't normally come here. And obviously because you have came here, there's obviously some kind of problem. He says, so what we'll do is we'll take, we'll take your bloods and we'll get them checked. So, right, okay. So I left the GPs, went into another room and got uh, one of the nurse practitioners that um, taken a load of blood samples. Um, and then they were getting sent off to the hospital. So anyway, I left the GPs, went on to work. And then, it must have been about um, half past 10, 11 o'clock. I got a phone call from the GP, which was amazing because I'd literally only left an hour or so before. But I got a, a phone call off the GP and he says, we've had your bloods checked. It looks like you could have um, leukemia. I was like, right, you, you've done all this in less than like two hours. He says, uh, obviously we need to double check. So I've made an appointment for you at, um, it was University Durham Hospital, which is literally five, 10 minutes away from where I live, which is ideal. I says, what time's the appointment? He says, 12 o'clock. So I'd literally just get back into work at this point, but had to leave again. So went to get the appointment in the hospital. Um, went to say the, um, the guy that deals with the, the blood, sorry, memory shot. Anyway, I went in there and they had done a couple of other blood tests while I was there. And then I was invited into a room with the, um, the doctor and also with someone from Macmillan. And here in the UK, we have Macmillan nurses who support cancer patients in, in various ways. So when I went into the room, as I said, there was just myself, the doctor and the Macmillan nurse. And he explained that, um, right, it looks like I have uh, chronic myeloid leukemia. Um, briefly explained what that was. Um, and then he said, right, the good thing is that although CML is quite a rare disease, it's actually had quite a lot of funding, like over previous years, so the last 20, 30 years, it's had a lot of funding uh, to develop that. And there is um, medication that I can take, um, potentially on the medication for life. Um, so what the, what the medication actually does is the way CML works is that I have a faulty gene where one gene is split off and joined another gene um, and it's, um, it's called the Philadelphia plus gene without getting complicated. But what this gene actually does, it sends the wrong, wrong signal which then means that your body produces more white blood cells than it actually should have and that's what causes all the issues, I think, something like that. Um, so anyway, he says, right, so we'll start you on some medication. Um, and from what I remember, I took this once a day. So he put me on a, a drug called Imhatanib. Um, I, I managed to get some straight away from the hospital that I was in. Um, and then obviously started the treatment on that. It is a really strong, powerful drug. Um, and when I was taking it, um, I would say the first <clears throat> the first couple of weeks, um, I was feeling nauseous, sick, 
um, I would actually vomit as well. Sorry, bear with me. So I would be vomiting as well. Um, but anyway, I managed to get over that. Um, I think it is just a strong drug and your body needs to get used to it. So, how does CML actually affect me? Um, it's probably a good question. So one of the main things, oh, sorry, just to jump back a little bit, when I went in to see um, the, we're gonna call him the cancer doctor, because I can't remember the proper title. Anyway, I went to see the cancer doctor and obviously he took extra bloods, lay me down on the bed in, the, um, in his office room, whatever, and start giving me a physical examination. And when I was saying about that pain down in my uh, lower abdomen on the left side, that was actually my spleen. Um, and he touched, he knew exactly where to touch. Um, and he pushed on the spleen and I jumped. The pain was horrific, just literally for that split second though, it wasn't a long lasting pain. Um, but he knew exactly where to touch. And what actually happens is that from what I can gather, your white blood cells gather in the spleen and so it becomes enlarged. Um, and this is how we came to diagnose this very easy that way. Obviously, blood tests backed everything up, but it was him pushing the spleen. He realised exactly what it was straight away. So anyway, back to where I was. Um, got the drugs, started taking them. Um, as I say, it was, um, I think it was one or two tablets a day. I can't remember now. Um, made us feel really nauseous at the beginning. And then I was taking these, Bracken, get in, in, get in. I was taking these drugs for around three or four years. Yeah, about three or four years. Um, and it all started off, as I say, with just feeling nauseous, then everything settled, then everything seemed to be fine until maybe it's the 18 month mark when I was taking it and I started developing more and more cramp. <clears throat> um, now the cramps that I was getting is <clears throat> unless you get a matinee of cramps, you haven't got a clue what cramp is. It's not like um, an exercise type cramp. Um, it's not like a cramp that you get when you're in bed and you, you suddenly get a cramp in your leg. It's not that kind of cramp. This cramp is so debilitating. One second, Bracken's trying to get out again. The cramps, as I say, they are so debilitating. I will get cramps in every muscle that you can think of. So I'd have cramps in my toes, cramps in my feet, cramps in my ankle, where my ankle would actually bend in on itself, my foot, so me my foot was actually facing the wrong direction. Um, I'd get, obviously, the, the cramps that you get in your calves. I'd get cramps in the back of my thigh. Um, then, when you go to the, the toilet and you finished at the toilet and you, have a, and you wipe, I'd get cramp right down my back, um, like in the big uh, lateral muscles, which is really difficult and when I'm saying I get these cramps these aren't cramps that you can stretch out like a normal athletic cramp or something like that you can't do anything with it other than just agonize you know sit through the agony of the pain um, and some of these cramps would last upwards of an hour um, on one occasion I was actually vomiting um, and obviously I had my head over the toilet vomiting because of the medication and I got cramp in my tongue uh, which actually caused my tongue to twist and then go back down into my throat which then meant that I was choking as well really struggling to get my breath um, at the time there was only myself and my son in the house my son was upstairs with his headphones on typical teenager uh, headphones on playing a game and I was really struggling couldn't breathe um, obviously panicking as well because I couldn't breathe and I was choking. Anyway, I finally managed to calm down and settle myself down and sort of get through it. But um, I went upstairs to see my son and he was 
he, he got the shock of his life. Didn't recognise as my face had contorted that much with a cramp. My son didn't even recognise me, um, which was really difficult. So anyway, taking the medication, obviously I've been hunting around looking to see how we can make the cramps easier and stuff like that. I was drinking Indian tonic water for the quinine in that, um, and I must have been drinking maybe four or five bottles of that a day. Um, I was eating bananas to the point where I was sick of the sight of bananas. None of this actually helped at all. And then it was during a telephone conversation with uh, Alison and her friend, and our friend had stopped mid-conversation and says, oh, I need to go and take my quinine tablets. So hang on a minute, quinine tablets. What's them about? <laughs> so anyway, she was taking them for night cramps. So I got in touch with the doctor, asked if I could have some quinine tablets, put us on the prescription. Bingo. It made such a difference to the cramps that I'd been getting. Um, whenever I did get cramp, it was, because I was still getting the cramps, it didn't actually stop them. But they seemed to be a lot easier to try and stretch out, and the cramps didn't certainly didn't last as long. Um, I mean, as I said before, the quinine. Well, here's another example. I actually couldn't sleep one night. It doesn't matter which way I turned, like move my legs. I was I could feel cramp coming into them. So I ended up getting up because obviously I've been disturbing Alison. I'd get up, went downstairs, and I thought, right, I'll just lie in the, uh, on the sofa. And then all of a sudden, I got cramp in me uh, back of me thigh, jumped up, and um, I put my hands on the back of one of our chairs, and I was trying to stretch that that muscle out. Um, all of a sudden, the other leg went in exactly the same cramp, um, and it was that painful. I could, I then, I could feel me head getting lightheaded. I could hear you ringing in me ears, and I just passed out. I'd collapsed with a pain. And when I fell, I actually fell between um, like a sideboard unit and a wall. Um, and when I'd come round, it must have been a couple of hours later um, because I was freezing cold, still down on the floor, wedged between this uh, the unit and the wall. Um, so that was really bad, but that's the kind of cramps I was dealing with. Anyway, fast forward to... Um, 2001, I think it was, the cramps were getting worse, uh, becoming really bad. Um, I was getting cramps literally every half an hour, something would go into cramp and I would be trying to stretch them out. And as I say, it would take so long to get rid of the cramp. I was exhausted at the end of it. And I could have cramp for maybe an hour and I would be off my feet and lying in bed exhausted for the next four or five hours so absolutely terrible so anyway, i got the point where they were that bad i actually went back to the the cancer doctor and explained look these cramps are not getting any better and i'm in so much pain i would actually rather have the leukemia than take continue to take the medication at this point um he said, right, we'll take you off that medication and we're going to try you on something else. So I'm now taking a drug called Nilotinib. Um, take this twice a day, so two, two tablets on the morning and two on an evening. Um, you are supposed to take them, it's like 12 hours apart, an hour before meals or two hours after you've eaten or something like that. It's really complicated the way they work and it, it I started off doing this really strict um, as best I could, but it was really hard work. And I think um, that's what puts a lot of people off this, uh, the nilotinib drug, because it is so complicated. Um, but now I've sort of, I take it on the morning when I get up and I take it before I go to bed, basically. Um, as far as food goes, I just sort of eat when I'm hungry. Um, so I'm probably not taking the drug 100% as it should be, but I'm taking it and it seems... <coughs> Bear with. Oh, I'm getting... <laughs> Talking about cramps still, because I do still get them. And 
just getting it in my foot. So my ankle has just actually twisted. Um, oh, bear with me two seconds. Wow, so, <laughs> just as I'm talking about cramp there, um, I got cramp in my ankle, which causes my foot to actually turn inside. I would have showed you, but it, it is really painful when it happens, so I've had to put the camera down and uh, just try and sort that out. It's not too bad because once you get into the position, you can sort of just put your weight back onto the foot and it straightens it up a bit, so that one's pretty easy to sort out. Um, oh, I can't remember why I was up there now. Yes, so obviously change the drugs, now taking uh, Nilotinib. I still do get cramp um, and I'm still taking the quinine tablets and the quinine tablets 100% help with the cramps. When I do get cramp, they are a lot less often and a lot less painful. Don't last as long and easier to stretch out. So it is so much better um, on the Nilotinib Dr uh, drugs that I'm taking and also the quinine tablets for the crumb. So that's so much better. Um, sorry, drifted off a little bit there because I was talking about how CML actually affects me personally. Obviously it will affect different people different ways. Bracken, in. I'm sorry, got the dog bloody trying to get out again. Let's just pull him back in. He's a little bit there. Oi, get in. Just gonna spin you around so you can see where he's up now. So he likes looking out there and everybody's walking past. And just over the side there, there's a shelf. And he puts his, he puts his paws on the shelf and he likes to lean outside them doors as far as he can. Don't you? I'm talking about you. <laughs> Right, get down, I know. Lie down. Go and settle. So, um, how does it affect us? It is one of them things where I'm one of these people who's just like, right, I've got it, I can't do anything about it, so I just crack on and do the best I can. Um, it probably does affect a lot of people differently. Um, I guess when you're first told that you, you have cancer or your type of cancer, it probably affects a lot of people very differently. I was just like, right, okay, so what do we do about it? Um, and ironically, it was just a matter of fact with me to the point where I actually just sent Alison a text message and said, oh, I've just been to the, the doctors, which she didn't even know I was going to the doctors. But I just said, been to the doctors, um, they've done a couple of tests, they think I've got leukemia. I sent all that in a text, not actually realizing how much of a shock that would have been, Alison. Um, so anyway, Alison, if you're watching, I apologise for the way I've done that. Um, as I say, there was a McMillan nurse in when I was first told about it, and I think they're there to help comfort you and explain things a little bit more. Um, but I was fine. I, right, I've got leukaemia out. What do I do now? I still believe I'm one of the lucky ones. Um, you know, you go into hospital and you see young kids, and they're on... Um, you know, the hooked up the machines and things like this. And it's like, I've had a good life so far. And like I say, I am one of the lucky ones because it's affecting me now at this age, not when I was a kid. Um, so yeah, strange. Anyway, I'd, I'd left work for the day and went home and obviously had a bit chat with Alison and stuff. And our daughter, um, she was upstairs at the time and Alison had briefly told her about it and I went upstairs to see my daughter and try and explain to her and she just stood up and threw her arms around us and gave us a hug and the two of us just start crying uh, which was really strange because I'm not um, really like emotional that way or anything but I think it was just the case of it was my daughter and she was emotional over it and probably worried and didn't actually understand it. Um, so yeah, it, it was a little bit hard like that. I'd 
also, um, I actually have two brothers, and one of my brothers became quite poorly at the time. Um, and my mother was really worried about him. And then obviously I had to go down and tell her that I had this leukemia, so probably wasn't the best timing for that. But I just think if everybody knows about it, then if you're showing any kind of symptoms, they can understand a little bit more, things like that. So I've always been very open about speaking about CML um, and discussing it with people if they want to know. Um, I still work full time, um, although I do sort of half my time at home and the other half in the office. Um, but yeah, just open, honest with people, to speak to them, tell them exactly what's going on. Um, where our work's been really good with um, issues and you know appointments for the hospitals and things like that. Um, obviously, I actually have um, primary progressive multiple sclerosis as well and also cervical stenosis, so I've got been hit with a few things. But like I say, if it's fun out, I'll have it. Um, as far as the CML itself, obviously you get, I get a lot of bone pain, and that sounds weird trying to explain what bone pain is. It's like a really deep pain inside of like whether it's your leg or whether it's your arm, it's it's a, a really dull, deep pain that you get, um, and it's it's not the kind of pain that you you can't tolerate. It you can tolerate it. It's just it's constant. It's it's like having toothache deep inside of uh, a bone. It's it's that kind of pain. It's constantly there. Um, that comes and goes. You might get it that will last uh, a couple of days or a couple of weeks, and then it'll go. Um, another thing that affects us is um, breathlessness. You get out of breath really easy. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm overweight at the minute, so I know that's not helping. But at the time, I was I was fit, um, and I was really breathless. Walk 10, 15 feet, um, and I'd be out of breath. That still continues now. Obviously, you've got the MS on top of that, which also causes breathlessness. Um, or else fatigue. So fatigue is a major one. Now, again, fatigue is really bad with uh, CML patients, and it's really bad with MS patients. So I've got that twice, um, and fatigue is a nightmare. And you can't explain fatigue to someone who's never had it. People think when you say fatigue, you're just tired. It's not. It's not tiredness. It's like someone has literally came and flicked the switch, and all you want to do is shut down. And that's exactly what it's like. It's not, I've just run a marathon, I'm really tired. It's not that kind of tiredness, although I've never run a marathon, so... <laughs> But it, the fatigue just hits you. You can be doing something and then all of a sudden you just want to stop and switch off. And it is, it's like when you say these, you know, films or cartoons and things when you've got a, a robot and you just flick the switch and they're just like shut down. It's exactly what you want to do and that's fatigue. And that hits you really bad. And you just need to shut down and it might, you might just shut down for 10, 15 minutes and then you'll be back to normal but it is so strange. Um, so yeah, I think that's probably about it for the CML side of things. Um, treatment wise, I, I still get, um, I have to go and get my bloods taken uh, regular. It was uh, once, started off once a fortnight, then once a month, then once every three months, and once every six months, um, which I think I'm still doing now, about once every six months. It's hard to keep track because obviously I get my bloods taken because of the MS as well, because I've got primary progressive MS, um, which is a nightmare because there's actually, I'm actually one of three people in the world who's been diagnosed with both CML and primary progressive multiple sclerosis. So how lucky am I? <laughs> Great, eh? Anyway, I think Bracken's getting a little bit I'll try to do it at the minute. <laughs> I'm going to finish my coffee, so I think we'll leave this video here for now. Um, 
hear us in the comment section if uh, if you've got any questions or you just want to tell us about your story as well um, be happy to hear you that we will try and reply to every comment that we get we love getting the comments um, if you're enjoying our YouTube channel and our little adventures in big red the little silver camper van um, with our dogs then subscribe like hear us in the comments and we'll see you soon bye